we have been looking at Balaam and the way of Balaam and the doctrine, the teaching of Balaam, and it's been several weeks, so plenty of time to think about this strange madman, this different man, mystery, mystery man, and how the devil used him to bring Israel down to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab, and a lot to think about, and I hope that you have read over these chapters and thought about Balaam because the Lord warns us in the message to the church at Pergamos that, and this is a message, it's not just to the church at Pergamos because we've mentioned every message to the seven churches ends with, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So it's all churches God wants to pay attention and know this, what's this doctrine of Balaam? And it is, Balaam didn't separate and compromise worked with King Balak and the whole situation Israel was watching and must have been listening. Why would I say they must have been listening? Well, if you turn to when when Balaam is finally done with, look in Numbers chapter 31. When they slay Balaam with the sword, which is fitting because he stood against the sword of the word of the Lord. And remember that the Lord Jesus addresses himself to the church at Pergamos as he that hath the sword with two edges, the sharp sword with two edges, that Balaam was slain with the sword, and all those that reject the word of the Lord, it is the word of the Lord that will stand against them and slay them. And Numbers 31, before we did, we, we haven't prayed to start this off, have we? No, we haven't. Before we get going, any further, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness to us, all your blessings every day. You pray for the Hadley family, that you be close to them and comfort them. And so thankful that Brenda knows you as a Savior. And just pray that you keep her from pain. And pray that as you come to your word tonight, that your Holy Spirit would teach us and that you would help us to understand this man, Balaam, that we might understand uh, how uh, false teaching gets into churches today and that you'd help us to hold fast in these days to your word, to your truth, and not to budge. Pray that you would help us as we go through your word tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. So, in Numbers 31, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Avenge the children of Israel, the Midianites. And Balaam was a Midianite. Afterwards shalt thou be gathered unto thy people. Moses spake unto the people, saying, Arm some of yourselves unto the war. Let them go against the Midianites and avenge the people of Midian. And every tribe a thousand throughout all the tribes of Israel shall ye send to the war. 
So they were delivered out of the thousands of Israel, a thousand of every tribe, 12,000 armed for war. And Moses sent them to the war, a thousand of every tribe, them and Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the priest, to the war with the holy instruments and the trumpets to blow in his hand. And they warred against the Midianites as the Lord commanded Moses, and they slew all the males, and they slew the kings of Midian, beside the rest of them that were slain, namely Evi, and Rechem, and Zer, and Hur, and Reba, five kings of Midian, and Balaam also the son of Beor, they slew with the sword. This is the last battle that the Lord tells Moses to go and fight. And as you continue down through, it says, The children of Israel took all the women of Midian captives, their little ones, and took the spoil of all their cattle and all their flocks, all their goods, and they burnt all their cities wherein they dwelt, and all their goodly castles with fire. They took all the spoil and all the prey, both of men and of beasts. They brought the captives and the prey and the spoil unto Moses and Eleazar the priest, and unto the congregation of the children of Israel, unto the camp at the plains of Moab, which are by Jordan near Jericho. And Moses and Eleazar the priest and all the princes of the congregation went forth to meet them without the camp. And Moses was wroth with the officers of the host, with the captains over thousands and the captains over hundreds, which came from the battle. Why was Moses upset? Moses said unto them, Have ye saved all the women alive? Behold, these caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam. So somewhere along the line, the Bible tells us that Israel listened to the counsel. The word there, counsel, means words or speech or sayings of Balaam. And they listened to Balaam. And they must have said, oh, he's blessing Israel. He's not so bad. You know, sounds like a good guy to me. But his associations were all, God had said, don't go that way. Don't work with these people. And God stood in the way three times, and Balaam goes around him. And the children of Israel listened to the counsel of Balaam to commit trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor. And there was a plague against the congregation of the Lord. So Balaam, this doctrine of Balaam, caused Israel to link up with the Moabites and to fall into sin and terrible sin, so much so that in Numbers 25, there's 24,000 people that die in a plague. 24,000 people. The Moabites were given over to immorality, worshiping their false gods, and the diseases that went along with that, God knew would spread throughout his people if they continued in that sin and God in mercy it seems like drastic measures but God in mercy tells Moses to just slay everyone his men that would join unto Baal Peor just wipe them out and along with Phineas who took a javelin and went and and drove it through a Midianite, this woman that had come in to the site of the congregation of the children of Israel, and God stopped the plague when they dealt when they dealt with the situation. We came to last week. We looked at. The third, the last view when ba King Balak took Balaam up on the mountain, and this was in Peor. And this is really where 
the children of Israel started sympathizing, uh, listening to the council, whatever they were paying attention, they were watching, and they said, oh, yeah, we can, we can link up with the Moabites. And we looked at Balaam's last parable that he takes up. And in that last parable, Balaam, because God gives Balaam a parable, and you know, every time, even though Balak is paying Balaam to curse Israel, God intervenes and says, you can't curse Israel. Can't curse my people. It's impossible. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? You can't do it. There's therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. You can't do it. And so Balaam brings these tremendous blessings, messages upon uh, Israel. And when you're reading through the life of Balaam for the first time or even the second, third, fourth time, you think, man, he was a good guy. He was a really good guy. He just got, you know, associated with the wrong man. Well, Jesus taught that false prophets are wolves in sheep's clothing. This wasn't a really good guy even though he seems so good. And he's so big and spiritual that when he comes to this last chapter, he keeps calling himself the man whose eyes are open. I mentioned last week, I believe that, uh, just like the Pharisees in Jesus' day, that because he said he could see, he was blind. Yes, the word that he gave was true, it was from God, but... He didn't take any heed to that word. Uh, he wasn't walking according to faith in God. Everything between Balak and Balaam, I know this is a lot of review, but there's so much uh, that we need to remember about this man, Balaam. Everything about Balaam and Barak, Barak, Balak. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. What? <laughs> Uh, was their point of view. You know, going to go up on this mountain, look, look at things from this point of view. Look at things from this point of view. Look at things, and Monday morning devotions, I happened across Isaiah chapter 11, thinking about Balaam. Balaam is, because he's a false prophet, false prophets are counterfeits. False prophets are antichrists. The Bible calls them antichrists. I know Balaam is in the Old Testament, so he's in a class of his own, uh, you might say, but he is an antichrist, and you see how, as you read his story, as you read about Balaam, he counterfeited the Lord in different ways. Balaam kept saying something that the Lord would say. What, what was it that Balaam said that the Lord would keep saying? Well, you think about that and uh, remind me that's what I was talking about after I turned to this passage. And I was thinking this morning after the message, there was something I was going to say that I never said because I got saying something else. But... Last, uh, last Monday I was reading, and in Isaiah 11, which talks about the coming of the Lord Jesus, and in verse 3 it says, He shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. And where I had just preached the night before on Balaam and Balak. Keep getting another view. Got to have another view. Got to have another view. 
We're going to look next week at the church at Thyatira. And the Lord Jesus says, just hold fast what you've got. You just hold fast to the word I've given to you. You stick, just stick to the, what the Bible says. We don't need new views, uh, new uh, psychology, new philosophy, uh, new translations. We definitely don't need new translations that are constantly changing and changing and changing. We just got to hold fast to what we've got. And the Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus, he didn't judge according to the sight of his eyes. You say, well, you've got to look things over. Yes, we do. Definitely, you've got to look things over. You've got to evaluate things. But you evaluate things according to God's word. Balaam and Balak, they were not trying to evaluate anything according to God's word. If they had been, they would have met together and said, no, God said he's going to bless Israel. We might as well forget this. It would have been the end of the, end of the story. But they were, well, let's look at it this way. And the Lord Jesus, he doesn't judge according to sight. He judges according to his eternal word, his promises uh, that never change. He doesn't reprove after hearing of his ears. It's according to his word. And yes, Joshua sent 12 spies to spy out the land. You got to look. You, yes, God says to look things over, evaluate things. But you walk by faith, not by sight. You evaluate according to faith in God. Two spies came back. We have faith in God. We can take this land. All we have to do is obey God. He'll help us. And it wasn't according to their own, be not wise in your own eyes, we've mentioned. Balaam was a type of false prophet. What did I say I was going to come back to? Probably this thought. Probably this thought. Balaam was a type of false. Oh, it was. What did what did Balaam say several times that the Lord Jesus would say several times throughout his ministry? Because Balaam was a counterfeit. And it's just this little phrase. You notice how Balaam kept saying, I can only speak what God tells me to speak. I can only speak what God tells me to speak. I can only speak what God tells me to speak. Well, that's true of the Lord Jesus Christ. It wasn't true of Balaam. It, he was, well, he spoke what God told him to speak, but he was not living what God wanted him to live. He's going in the wrong way. He's going in his own way. Look at John chapter 12 just as a sample. And I'm just saying, I'm just going over these thoughts about Balaam's life as we're coming near to the end of uh, studying Balaam's life to stress that we've got to be on our toes We've got to be in God's word and studying God's word and comparing scripture with scripture. And we've got to remember that false teachers come as angels of light. They transform themselves as angels of light and ministers of, uh, where's that passage? Where's the Bible tell us that? As we turn to John chapter 12, where is it that God tells us that? False prophets, false teachers are angels of light. You know what that is? Anybody know where that is? I thought it was right there. Okay, it must be over here. Where did it go? There it is. If 
Find it? 2 Corinthians chapter 11. In verse 14 it says, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. If you turn, uh, go up to the next verse, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. That's interesting. The Catholic Church, a lot of these Catholic churches, they'll, they'll have on their sign, you know, Church of the Holy Apostolate Fathers. No. No. The apostles were the 12 apostles. And... There's no apostolic power passed down to the Catholic Church. We know that. But they will talk big. You know, I'm, I just say what God, I just say what God tells me to say. That was Balaam. Well, thank God that today we hold the Bible in our hands. And we can say, no, that's not what God said. This is what God said to do to practice to uh, this isn't doctrine whatever the situation we can evaluate it through God's word says therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness we're talking about Satan's ministers transform themselves as ministers of righteousness and every day on the news you read of another scandal uh, Catholic priests molesting, abusing children. And here they present themselves as ministers of righteousness. Now Jesus gives us our righteousness. He's the only one that can give us our righteousness. And God says, whose end shall be according to their works. It, the Lord will judge them for that. But Balaam... Do you think about, oh, did we never read that John chapter 12, did we? Back, I just put my, to pull my finger out of there. John chapter 12, the end of the chapter, uh, we can start in verse 48. Jesus said, he that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words, hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken of myself. But the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment that I should, uh, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. I'll take that. I'll take that from the Lord Jesus. But we don't want to take it from anyone else. The, the the scary thing with the story of Balaam and Balak, we mentioned last week that you have, I believe, a foreshadowing or at least a, a picture of things that are going to happen between the false prophet and the beast during the tribulation period and the dragon, the unholy uh, trinity. You can see how it's going to work, and it's all going to sound like, wow, this looks pretty good. This sounds pretty good. We can all link together. We can all go with that. We can work with that. <clears throat> well, we can't. We're not going to be there anyway. Praise God. Praise God. I've been thinking, I told Mrs. Bartlett last week as she was going out the door, uh, Brother Bartlett, so many times, and I know I've met, he'd say, going out Sunday morning, he'd say, isn't heaven going to be wonderful? And it is. And shh, we're just not going to even be able to believe it. It would be so wonderful. But it's wonderful to serve the Lord here now. And Paul said, uh, to die is gain. Nevertheless, 
to abide in the flesh is more needful for you all. We need each other. We need each other. We need to look out for each other, help each other. That's why the Lord's keeping us here. Encourage one another and to be a testimony for the Lord. But heaven is going to be wonderful. So we haven't even got to our... Let's just skim over. So last week we saw Balaam's last message. And the last message that the Lord gave him was, Israel is just wonderful. God has blessed it so, and it is so beautiful. Uh, how goodly are thy tents, O Jacob, thy tabernacles, O Israel. And as the valleys are spread forth, as gardens by the river, just this beautiful, not just a beautiful picture, but also the beautiful smells. Uh, Israel, God has blessed Israel. God's plan of salvation, the uh, sweetest story that was ever told. There's nothing like it. Uh, the world has nothing to offer that even compares to it. Salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. Then Balaam ends, he ends his message, just like he ended his second message is that, well, actually every message ends that Israel will have victory over their enemies in the end through the Lord Jesus Christ. And his second message and his third message, he ends with the Lord Jesus as a picture of a lion. And we know Revelation tells us that Jesus is the lion of Judah. And the Lord is going to pounce in that last day on the enemies of Israel. He will deliver Israel, and he will reign from Israel. Verse 9, these are the last, the last verse of Balaam's message. Talking about the Lord Jesus, he, he couched, he lay down as a lion, as a great lion. Who shall stir him up? Blessed is he that blesseth thee, and cursed is he that curseth thee. I don't believe I read these verses, these beautiful verses, in Jeremiah. Jeremiah, I say beautiful verses talking about the Lord is going to come as a lion. They're beautiful in that our God is so powerful, our God is so great. He is in control. Uh, though the world band themselves together, join together against him, he will be victorious, but they at the same time are strong, strong verses for those that reject the Lord. Jeremiah chapter 25, talking about the Lord as a lion. We didn't read these verses, did we? The Lord as a lion in Jeremiah chapter 25, beginning in verse 30 says, Therefore prophesy thou against them all these words, and say unto them, The Lord shall roar from on high, and utter his voice from his holy habitation. He shall mightily roar upon his habitation. He shall give a shout. That's what Balaam said in his first message, remember? That the shout of a king. Is that the first message, second message? Second message that Balaam had, the shout of a king is among them. As Jesus is a victorious king. He is king of kings and lord of lords. It says, he shall give a shout as they that tread the grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth. A noise shall come even to the ends of the earth, for the Lord hath a controversy with the nations. He will plead with all flesh. He will give them that are wicked to the sword, saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, evil shall go forth from nation to nation, and a great whirlwind shall be raised up from the coast of the earth, and the slain of the Lord shall be at that day from one end of the earth even unto the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented, neither gathered nor buried. They shall be dung upon the earth. The Lord is going to come forth as a mighty lion to judge those that have rejected him and to defend 
Israel, his people. So what is Balaam's reaction to that message, to that kind of message? Well, it's the reaction of the world that they, they hate. They hate the whole thought of the plan of salvation. And Jesus said they hated me without a cause. And Balak, in verse 10, Balak's anger was kindled against Balaam. His true colors are showing through. He's filled with hate. He's filled with hate. Why do we want to work with the world? Why do we want to be like the world? Why do we want to link up with the world? They hate the Lord. Jesus told us to hate him. So why would we ever want to be like the world, relate to the world? Just love the Lord Jesus. Be as squeaky clean as you can be without spot, just unspotted from the world. Love the Lord Jesus. Be happy. Why do we want to be, why do churches today want to be like the world? The world hates the Lord. Well, Balaam shows how he's angry and he smote his hands together. Uh, just, and, and Balak said unto Balaam, I call thee to curse my enemies. You want to be an enemy? To be, to be an enemy of Israel was to be an enemy of God. He's, I call thee to curse my enemies, and behold, thou hast altogether blessed them these three times. Therefore now flee thou to thy place. Get out of here. Get out of here, Balaam. The world can't even agree amongst themselves. The world, you know, we we get we talk about so Christians, uh, you know, conflict, and they might not be in a, in agreement, have harmony. Well, we got a lot more, a lot, because there's perfect unity in the Lord Jesus. Um, as far as the details of uh, that comes in just obeying God's word. All Christians that agree to follow God's word together, they have that God's given us the unity. All we have to do is follow God's word. It's, it's just through his word. It's through his spirit. But the world's never, even though they band themselves together in the end against the Lord, against his anointed, they're going to be destroyed. They're not, they're not going to have any, there's no victory in rejecting the Lord, none at all. And here, Balaam and Balak, they tried so hard to work together. No, you follow the, the devil, you go against God's word, it's never going to work out. It never will. And so, Balak says, just flee. Get away from me. Get out of here. I thought to promote thee unto great honor, but lo, the Lord hath kept thee back from honor. What Lord are you talking about? Um, Balak is so, they're both so confusing. But we know the Lord would never honor anything that they were up to. And Balak, Balaam said unto Balak, Spake I not also to thy messengers, which thou sentest unto me? And Balaam is always playing this spirit, super spiritual. You know, uh, everything he did, he just presented himself as super spiritual, even though he's going exactly against God's way. You know, well, I was, I was honest, and right from the beginning I was honest and upright, and I told your other messengers what I was doing. Get out of here. Yes, you can't. The deceitful workers is what Paul said. The deceitful workers. These false teachers are so deceitful. He says, Spake I not also to thy messengers which thou sentest unto me, saying, If Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the commandment of the Lord to do either good or bad in my own mind. But what the Lord saith, that will I speak. Balak's uh, um, Balaam's playing the same fiddle. He started out way back when he went totally against God's word, saying the same thing. He's a liar. 
And God tells us in the New Testament that he loved the wages. He loved the wages of unrighteousness. He loved gain. He was after greedy gain. But he keeps lying. God help us. God help us to see through the tricks of the devil. And now, behold, I go unto my people. Come, therefore. I think this is uh, Balaam's last dig. He's going to get a dig in. All right, Balak, we're through. You want me to go away? But let me tell you one last thing. And God gives, once again, God does give Balaam a parable. And it is that the Lord Jesus will come and reign. And he will destroy all his enemies. And Moab is going to be destroyed. It's all going to be destroyed. And so he says, he took up his parable and said, Balaam the son of Beor hath said, and the man whose eyes are open hath said, and remember, he's saying himself that his eyes are open. But God had to open his eyes when God stood in front of him three times and he couldn't see. This man never sees to believe in God as his righteousness, to have the uh, righteousness of God imputed unto him. And so you remember Micah chapter five, chapter 6, just a powerful passage um, that ties Balaam and the Moabites in as far as, you know, was God going to be pleased with thousands and thousands of, however Micah put it, thousands of sacrifices, you know, Balaam never got it through his head, or his heart, we should say, to just put simple faith in God for salvation. But he says, I'm the man whose eyes are open. Verse 16, he has said, which heard the words of God and knew the knowledge of the Most High. Something that, in studying this week, a totally different topic, but it said all through Scripture, the high place belongs to God. The high place belongs to God. Where did Balak and Balaam like to go? Up to the high place and act like they were gods, act like they were in control. The high place belongs to God. He has said, which heard the words of God and knew the knowledge of the Most High, which saw the vision of the Almighty, fallen into a trance, but having his eyes open. I shall see him, but not now. It's kind of sad. It is sad that Balaam could not see the Lord now. Um, Abraham, Abraham saw the Lord Jesus Christ afar off. How's that in, in John chapter 8? Jesus said, Abraham, rejoice to see my day. Abraham, by faith, looked ahead to the coming of the Lord Jesus and believed on Jesus as Savior. Balaam never believed. He says, I shall see him, but not now. Well, you better, you got to see him now. you got to see him in this life, or you're never going to see him. But Balaam says, I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob. That is the Lord Jesus Christ, and he is the morning star. He is the, the morning star comes right before the day breaks, and it's the Lord Jesus that brings us to salvation, and it's the Lord Jesus that uh, through him the day breaks forth. And... This verse is what the wise men referred to when they were looking for the coming of the Lord Jesus. So it's an important verse, and God gave it to Balaam. God gave his truth in spite of, in spite of Balaam's heresy, his, his corrupt life. And a scepter shall come out of Israel. That's the Lord Jesus. And he shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the children of Sheth, which are children of Moab. So, before, you know, Balak says, okay, Balaam, flee. Get out of here. And Balaam says, 
Well, before I go, let me give you this one last message. Let me tell you, God will have the final word. He has the final word. And Balaam tells Balak, God's going to destroy Moab. God's going to reign. When you look over the, you look down from this mountain, and from the, the Peor, you could see all way, way, way out. And you could see where the Amalekites camped. You could see the Moabites camped. You could see, you could see these cities in the distance. And God says, Jesus is going to reign over it all. He's going to reign over it all. And so it says, Edom, which are the descendants of Esau, shall be a possession. Seah also shall be a possession for his enemies. Israel shall do valiantly. And Balaam, uh, Balaam must be, oh, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. Israel shall do valiantly. Out of Jacob shall come he that shall have dominion. That's the Lord Jesus. And shall destroy him that remaineth of the city. And when he looked on Amalek, he took up his parable and said, Amalek was the first of the nations. What do you mean the first of the? Well, they were the first nation to come against Israel in battle. They thought they were big stuff. They're the first of the nations. But Jesus said, the first shall be last. His latter end shall be that he perish forever. Tried to stand against the Lord. And he looked on the Kenites and took out the uh, Kenites of uh, Midianites and said, Strong is thy dwelling place, and thou puttest thy nest in a rock. Nevertheless, the Kenites shall be wasted until Asher, which is the Syrians, shall carry thee away captive. But the Balaam himself was a Midianite, and he's given this message that the Lord is going to come and reign. Uh, the Lord is going to destroy those that stand up against him. And he took up his parable and said, Alas, who shall live when God doeth this? When God, when the Lord Jesus comes to reign, who's going to live? Well, he's going to slay the nations with the word of his mouth. Who shall live when God doeth this? And ships shall come from the coast of Chittim, which is the islands of the sea of uh, Mediterranean Sea, and shall afflict Asher, and shall afflict Eber, and he shall also perish forever. And Balaam rose up and went and returned to his place, and Balak also went his way. There's going to come a day during the tribulation period that here the nations of the earth have banded together, saying, you know, let us cast off his bands asunder. They just don't want to have anything to do with the Lord. There's going to come a day when God says, you're done. You're finished. This is over. And he'll dash them to pieces as a, as a posture, just dash them to pieces, and the Lord Jesus shall reign. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word how good your word is, thrills our hearts that this is going to happen, just thrills us that these things will come to pass, that we will be in heaven with you someday, and just rejoice in that your word is true, and that all your plans and your word uh, are true, and uh, that it happened. Uh, we rejoice that this is going to happen. Thank you for your word, and just help us to live as victorious Christians. Uh, faith is a victory that overcomes the world, and in spite of all the hard things in the world today, to know that we have victory in you. Pray that you help us this week to be a testimony and help us also to be a comfort. So many sick and, and hurting. Help us to be a comfort this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm. Thank you.